Welcome to Things You Don't Know. In this episode, we will look into a topic that has faded in the public's awareness. Undoubtedly, this is because of the nature of the material and the fact that it was part of a dreadful time for the USA. It was called Project 100,000. Let's take a look at some of the factual historical events. The year was 1966. The United States was deep into the Vietnam War, a conflict that had escalated rapidly and was becoming increasingly unpopular at home. The draft was in full effect, the lottery system. <laughs> yeah. But there was a growing concern at the highest levels of government. How could the military sustain its troop levels without expanding the draft to even more young men, many of whom were in college or had deferments for various reasons? Some small numbers were gathered through a secret recruitment plan, which took place in northern New York and other areas on the, near the Canadian border. Between 1966 and 1972, approximately 45,000 young men opposed to the Vietnam War sought refuge in Canada. Between 1966 and 1971, 10,000 Canadians volunteered for U.S. military service in exchange for U.S. citizenship and enlistment bounties but many more personnel were needed. Enter Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, a man with a background in business and a reputation for cold, calculated decision-making. McNamara believed very strongly that America's military needed more manpower, but he also wanted to avoid the political backlash that might come from expanding the draft too aggressively. Thus was born Project 100,000, a program designed to meet military needs by recruiting men who would have otherwise been considered unfit for service due to low armed forces qualification test, uh, the AVQT scores. These men, often referred to as new standards men, or more derisively, McNamara's morons, were individuals who had been previously disqualified for reasons ranging from educational deficiencies to physical issues. Just why was this program created? And why did it avoid pulling in those with deferments? As we said, first and foremost, the military needed more soldiers. The war in Vietnam was demanding more and more resources and the pool of eligible draftees was shrinking. Remember, this is also at the height of the Cold War, so there are American forces all over the world. The Pentagon hopes to bolster the ranks by lowering the entrance standards without sparking widespread outrage or protest. Project 100,000 aimed to bring in 100,000 new recruits each year significantly boosting the military's numbers. At that time, college deferments were a hot-button issue. Expanding the draft to include more young men in college would have sparked significant political and social backlash. The college educated were more likely to be vocal, more connected to the media and political power, and more likely to protest. The government could avoid a politically costly battle by targeting those not in college and who were less likely to have the means or connections to resist. Interestingly, McNamara also framed Project 100,000 as a social welfare initiative. Mm -hmm. He argued that the military service could provide these men with education, training, and opportunities they wouldn't have otherwise. In theory, this would uplift them out of poverty and give them skills they could use in civilian life. 
However, the reality was far grimmer. Many of these recruits were given the most dangerous assignments in Vietnam, and they suffered disproportionately high casualty rates. Those who did return often found that their military training had little applicability in civilian life, leaving them worse off than before. A small number found success. For example, an illiterate farmer from Nebraska became first the driver and later the cook to General Fred Wynan, the deputy of General Abrams. Several of these stories are recounted in Sergeant Hamilton Gregory's book, McNamara's Folly. Now, let's talk about the deferments. During the Vietnam War, deferments were a way to delay or avoid military service. College students, certain workers in essential in industries, and men with medical conditions could receive deferments. The government was acutely aware of the social and political power of those who held these deferments, particularly the college educated. Expanding the draft, as we said, to include those men would provoke outrage and potentially destabilize the institutions the government relied on to maintain public order. Protests against the war were already widespread on college campuses. Drafting more students would likely have amplified the unrest, leading to a broader movement that could threaten the war effort itself. So instead of risking the political and social consequences of ending or limiting deferments, the government chose a different path. Project 100,000 allowed them to quietly increase the number of men sent to Vietnam without facing the backlash that might come from drafting more privileged elements and segments of society. But the cost of this decision was borne by those least able to resist it. The men brought into the military pro through Project 100,000 were often poorly educated from low income backgrounds, had few opportunities, and were, shall we say, less intellectually gifted. Instead of being uplifted, many were sent into battle with inadequate preparation, leading to tragic outcomes. Project 100,000 ended in 1971, although many of the men procured by Project 100,000 served in the field until the end of the war. The legacy of Project 100,000 is really a complicated one. On one hand, it met its goals of providing the military with much needed manpower. On the other hand, it did so at a great human cost disproportionately affecting the poor, the uneducated, and as I said, the less intellectually gifted. Today, Project 100,000 serves as a sobering reminder of the lengths to which governments will go to sustain their policies, even at the expense of the most vulnerable in society. A sad reminder. Secretary McNamara had a strong belief in the value of technology to educate and train Project 100,000 soldiers. The military was encouraged to incorporate innovative methods, including the use of videotapes and other types of film. Videotapes were relatively new at this time and allowed for the constant and repeatable delivery of training content. This medium was particularly useful for Project 100,000 because it enabled the military to present instructional material in a controlled and standardized manner, ensuring that all recruits, regardless of their initial skill level or even ability to read, received the same quality of education. These tapes were used to teach basic literacy, arithmetic, and military skills. The medium's visual and auditory nature helped engage recruits who might need help with traditional text-based learning methods. 
By using video, instructors could illustrate complex concepts in a more accessible way, combining visual demonstrations with verbal explanation. The effectiveness of using videotape films in Project 100,000 was mixed. On the one hand, video instruction standardized and visual nature helped many recruits grasp basic concepts more quickly than they might have through conventional teaching methods. This was particularly beneficial for soldiers with limited formal education as it provided them with a more interactive and perhaps engaging learning experience. One of the problems with video training, particularly to somebody who is not skilled in those areas, is that when one has to think on one's feet or at the spur of the moment, sometimes the video training has faded into the background and the routine things are remembered, not some of the more critical factors of actually conducting warfare on the fly. You know, the overall effectiveness of Project 100,000 in achieving its broader goals remains debated to this day. While using videotapes enhanced the learning experience for many recruits, the program faced criticism for pushing unprepared individuals into combat situations where they might not have been adequately trained or mentally equipped to handle the rigors of war. Often what happened is a more capable uh, person would be informally linked with people that were in this uh, Project 100,000. And they kind of supervised, guided, etc., which meant that sometimes their attention was divided between themselves and the Project 100,000 man, leading to some problems. The success of these recruits in the military and their post-service lives varied significantly, with some benefiting from the skills and discipline they gained, while others they, they still really struggled to adapt. For these soldiers and those soldiers who did benefit, the use of videotapes in their education provided several key advantages. Improved comprehension, for example. The multimedia approach to help bridge the gap for recruits who struggled with reading and traditional learning methods, enabling them to better understand and perhaps to retain information. Videotapes also ensured a kind of standardized training. It ensured that all soldiers received the same level of instruction, reducing disparities in training quality across different units and locations. Yes, uh, instructors, drill instructors, etc., they vary in their um, capacity to train and their information background. So the videotaping material probably helped some in that regard. It also acted as a reinforcement of learning. Recruits could review the videotaped lessons multiple times, reinforcing their understanding and helping them master the material. It also provided a dynamic audiovisual kind of engagement, increased engagement, if you will. This was more engaging, particularly for people in this group, than static lectures or reading materials, helping to maintain the interest and motivation of the recruits. In summary, while the use of videotape 
films in Project 100,000 proved provided significant educational benefits to many recruits. The program's overall success was limited by broader issues related to the preparedness and the welfare of the soldiers involved. Use of technology was an innovative step in military training, offering a glimpse into the potential for multimedia learning and education. A significant portion of the troops recruited in the project under 1,000 were minorities, particularly African Americans. The program targeted individuals who were considered unfit for military service due to low intellectual or educational standards, and it disproportionately affected minorities and those from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. At the time, systematic inequalities in education and socioeconomic status meant that African Americans and other minority groups were more likely to fall into the categories that Project 100,000 aimed to recruit. As a result, a large percentage of the new standards men, as recruits were called, were minorities. This led to criticism that the program exploited disadvantaged groups by sending them into military service under the guise of providing them with opportunities for education and social mobility. The program's outcome, as we said, were mixed with while some participants benefited from the training and the discipline, many faced significant challenges both during and after their service, particularly those who were sent to the front lines in Vietnam. A high percentage of minorities in Project 100,000 has been a point of contention and has contributed to the ongoing debate about the ethics and the effectiveness of the program. In Project 100,000, it is reported about 10% of the recruits received valuable vocational training. This training was intended to equip soldiers with skills that could be useful both in the military and in civilian life after their service. The vocational training covered a range of fields, including mechanical and technical skills training in areas such as electronics repair, vehicle maintenance, and machinery operation. Soldiers learned how to repair and maintain radios, military vehicles, and other technical equipment. This could be applied to civilian jobs in automotive repair, electronics, and machinery. Some soldiers were trained in clerical tasks, including typing, filing, and general office work. This training aimed to prepare them for administrative roles within the military and similar positions in the civilian sector. A portion of the recruits received basic medical training, such as becoming medics or nursing assistants. They were taught first aid, emergency medical procedures, and patient care. This could be translated into jobs in healthcare after their service. Training in construction skills, including basic engineering, plumbing, and carpentry was also provided. These skills were useful for military construction projects and could also be applied to jobs in carpentry, construction, or engineering and civilian. The success of these soldiers in finding civilian employment after their military service varied. Those who received vocational training often had better prospects compared to their peers who did not. The skills they acquired were indeed valuable and transferable to the civilian workplace. However, several factors influenced their ability to secure jobs. Many of the recruits had very limited formal education before joining the military which sometimes made it difficult for them to translate their military training into civilian jobs, even with the additional vocational skills. I mean, it is difficult for somebody to get a job if they don't have a high school diploma, for example. Just saying. The economic conditions in the late 
1960s and early 1970s also played a role as the Vietnam War ended there was an influx of veterans into the job market which led to increased competition for jobs particularly in fields like construction and mechanics some veterans from project 100,000 faced stigma and discrimination when they returned home the label of being a new standards man sometimes carried negative connotations well let's be real almost always carried negative con connotations which could affect their job uh, prospects now the status of being a new standards man was not supposed to generally be known however let's be real it's often the case that status was frequently understood or uncovered in various ways i mean even just looking at the record people could tell there was also a lack of comprehensive support services for veterans transitioning to civ civilian life including job placement assistance, counseling, and educational opportunities, which hindered the uh, ability uh, of some to find and ma maintain stable employment. In conclusion, while the vocational training provided through Project 100,000 did offer valuable skills to a portion of the recruits, the overall impact on their post-military employment was, shall we say, mixed. Some were able to leverage the training into stable civilian jobs, but others faced significant barriers in the job market. The success of these veterans in civilian life often depended on a combination of their personal circumstances the broader in economic environment in which they were operating, because some places were easier to get jobs in than others, and the support available to them after their service. Another troubling aspect of Project 100,000 is that many of these recruits were disproportionately assigned to very dangerous combat roles, often on the front lines of Vietnam. They're is evidence to suggest that these men were sometimes placed in hazardous positions to preserve the lives of more qualified soldiers who were seen as more valuable due to their higher levels of training, ability, and experience. The new standards men were often assigned to infantry units, which had some of the highest casualty rates during the Vietnam War. The infantry role was inherently dangerous, involving direct combat with the enemy, often in difficult terrain and under severe conditions. Many of these men were sent into battle with minimal training, making them particularly vulnerable to the dangers of the war. The assignment of these men to high-risk roles can be seen as a cost-saving measure where they were used to fill gaps in manpower in the most perilous positions. This practice has been criticized as exploitative, as these men were often less prepared for combat and lacked the skills or experience that might have helped them survive in such conditions. Now, the placement of new standards men in these dangerous roles had several significant consequences some of which we've already mentioned. Many of these recruits suffered high rates of casualties. Their lack of training, preparation, and, and skill level, you have to be able to think on your feet on the fly. Combined with their placement in the most dangerous roles contributed to a disproportionate number of injuries and deaths among Project 100,000 soldiers compared to their more qualified peers. The intense 
and often traumatic experiences these men endured had long-lasting effects. Many of them returned home with severe psychological scars, including uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, which affected their ability to reintegrate into civilian life. Due to their initial low educational levels and the demanding nature of the roles they were assigned, many new standards men had limited opportunities for advancement within the military, which sometimes made their status more obvious to even outsiders. This often left them with few prospects for meaningful post-military careers, further compounding the difficulties they faced after their service. Now, the use of these men in high-risk roles has raised serious ethical questions about the fairness and humanity of Project 100,000. The program's critics argue that it effectively treated these men as expendable, valuing their lives less than those of better prepared soldiers. The treatment of New Standards men in Project 100,000, particularly their assignment to dangerous combat roles, is a dark chapter in the history of the Vietnam War. While the program was presented as an opportunity to uplift disadvantaged individuals by providing them with military training and discipline, the reality for many of these men was far more grim. They were often sent into the most perilous situations with little regard for their safety or future. In what can be seen as a sacrifice to protect the lives of more qualified soldiers, this practice has left a lasting legacy of controversy and criticism, highlighting the ethical dilemmas of using vulnerable populations in such a manner during times of war. It is very complex, and there are layers and layers to this issue. You know, it's, it's interesting that we, we started off with this, um, this particular episode. We were going to do something just about the audio-visual training. And as we got further and further into it, it was like, we can't do that without talking more about Project 100,000 and the antecedents to that program. And I hope that you've enjoyed or learned, probably not enjoyed. I certainly didn't enjoy it, but there is learning to be done here. And something we should remember, we should not put this behind us and forget it. This is an important, an important, very important lesson that we all should take note of. Anyhow, for now, we're, we will um, close this off. We have a lot of, a lot more things coming, so you know, please uh, join us soon. And we will delve into those things. And we have some other, uh, some, some real interesting ones coming that I think you probably will find very interesting. Things that, hey, you don't know. Imagine that. <laughs> Bye for now. As the son of a veteran who struggled for the rest of his life because of his Vietnam War service, I, I empathize with these men. And as a person with an exceptionality in different circumstances, I know how someone's life can be judged and the result of, of one test or one medical treatment, correct or not. So it reminds us all, I think, of the importance of looking at the entirety of a person's skill set their background, their personality, helping when you can without trying to micromanage people, and, and, and also a reminder of what political military leaders of all parties and backgrounds will do 
to justify something they think is valuable. As Dr. Weaver said, there are a lot of wonderful things coming up. Please do share, give us a like, comment. We look forward to seeing you again, both on Things You Don't Know and on our other History Twists podcasts. Take care, friends.